think the perfect title for this movie, Strange Illusion, is Strange Illusion. It, it is, think of Hamlet on steroids, and you'll get the picture of this movie. Uh, this was produced in 1945 at PRC, Producers Releasing Corporation. And you know, one of the many wags in Hollywood at some time said that PRC stood for pretty rotten crap. <laughs> however, however, that is not true. And uh, the director, Leon Fromkus, did a lot of work uh, from the 40s into the 1960s as a producer and a production assistant. And the director of this film is none other than the famous Edgar Omer. And uh, it's kind of interesting, Shakespeare and Edgar Omer. That, that is a very noirish combination, I must say. And we've had a number of people here uh, who have worked with Edgar Omer. Uh, we had, 12 years ago, we had Ann Savage here from Detour. I can't believe it's 12 years. And she talked about uh, Omer's brilliance in helping create that character of Vera by you know, taking all her makeup off, rearranging her hair, and streaking her hair with cold cream. And uh, on the other hand, we have Marsha Hunt, who was directed by Edgar Omer in a movie, Carnegie Hall, kind of an anthology movie. And, you know, Marsha was used to the sylvan touch of MGM, and she said, all of a sudden, this man came in and started yelling at everybody, and do this and do that, and yelling, and very authoritarian, and she said, I retired to my dressing room until Mr. Ulmer came and asked what was wrong, and I asked him, I'm not used to being yelled at, and he said, what, this is, this is the way I am. <laughs> so, I, I think I'm going to be very, in, we're going to be very interested in hearing from our special guest uh, about Edgar Ulmer, about this movie, and our special guest, this is a man whose career I think is getting close to 75 years. He started out in the movies in 1939. He became really well known for the popular Henry Aldrich series in the 1940s. Um, he was in The Time of Your Life with James Cagney. He pursued Elizabeth Taylor in Life with Father, directed by the great Michael Curtiz. But there is so much more to the career of Jimmy Lydon. He has a career behind the camera as a television, motion picture producer, uh, an executive, just so much. He was uh, at one time vice president of the Screen Actors Guild and on and on, and he's gonna share that with us. And the first time I talked to Jimmy was uh, about a year and a half ago, and I called him up to talk about Michael Curtiz. And he said to me, and he had a sore throat and we were on the phone for an hour. And he said to me, Alan, you're talking to a distraught man. I love show business so much, I still want to be in it. So he's going to share that love with us today after the movie. So please welcome our special guest, Mr. Jimmy Lydon. Thank you. Thank you. I've been a producer since 1962, and I never looked back again and, and made another motion picture or, or television or anything. And uh, I noticed tonight, uh, that we were using old nitrate film in those days, you know, and uh, and all of our night scenes are the first things that start to deteriorate in old film. We now have safety film, as you know, and, and all digital now, of course, and uh, uh, we don't have to worry about uh, about what's going to happen to the negative any, anymore. Yeah. And I was so surprised that that negative, uh, the daytime stuff is okay, but the nighttime stuff you can just barely... Yeah. It's an archival print. I don't know how long ago uh, UCLA preserved that, but how long it had been since you had seen that picture? Oh, I think uh, at least 60 years. <laughs> <laughs> so it's an idea how old I am. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so if you don't mind for one sure. second, uh, a week from Thursday, I'm going to be 90. Oh. That is terrific. Uh, now, how did you come to work for Fromkiss and make this picture with Ulmer? How did that happen? Uh, well, uh, you don't know how I got into the motion picture business. It's, it's, Tell us. It, well, uh, I'm one of nine kids. Irish Catholics, you know, I had six, six, brother, six brothers and two sisters, and I'm right in the middle. I had four brothers older and four brothers, two brothers and two sisters younger. and. Uh, my father 
was a very brilliant alcoholic. <laughs> and when he was drinking, which was most of the time, he was a very violent, violent human being. And in 19, 1937, he decided to retire. Now he had nine children. The youngest one was a girl and she was one year old. And uh, he came to dinner at, at the house one night and he sat at the head of the table for all of us and we were scared to death of him. And he said, I'm retiring. Just like that. And we, he drank up every other check and sometimes every check and we, we just lived on the edge of disaster, all of us. And uh, he did. He quit his job on Rector Street in right next to Wall Street in the financial district of New York, and he never worked again. And he told us he was not going to, and he never did. And so uh, all of we, we people down to me, I, I was about 13 at the time, my oldest brother was about 19 or 20, and uh, there weren't any jobs, none. And so my mother had an Irish friend who had two children in the theater. One was a boy about 10, the handsomest kid you ever saw. I was a long time from handsome, believe me. I had a shock of bright red hair and freckles, a zillion freckles, all that sort of stuff. And she said, why don't you put one of the kids in the theater, May, my mother's name was Mary May, and uh, uh, she said, if you open your mouth on a Broadway stage, you, get, you, you, you make uh, $45 a week, and in the 30s, that was a fortune. It really was, because a white-collar worker in those days, my father was the only one of 11 that ever went to college even, a white-collar worker in those days would make 18 to $22 a week. He could support a whole family on that. For $45 a week was a fortune. So my mother said, great, how do we go about it? She said, send me Jim after school tomorrow afternoon. So I met the woman on uh, 45th Street between Broadway and 6th Avenue, now called the Avenue of America's, mind you. And, uh, uh, I'm scared to death because I'd never seen a play in my life. I'd never had any any connection with drama or acting or anything. You know, I was a school kid like the rest of my family. And uh, so uh, the woman said, now, Jim, when your turn comes, you just go in there and do what they tell you. And I said, yes, ma'am, and my knees are shaking like castanets like this, you know. <laughs> and so I went in when my turn came to, to read for a play. And uh, the man said, what's your name? And I got that out without waiting on his rug. I was so nervous, you know. <laughs> and uh, he said, what have you done? I said, nothing. He said, get out of here. And so I told the lady what happened, and she said, no, 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 Jim, next time that happens, uh, uh, and he asked what you've done, you say, well, last year I was in this play, this play, and this play, and she gave me the titles only of three plays that had used children the year before. That was Thursday. Friday, the same thing for another play. And this is a deep depression in New, in, in New York, mind you, and, uh, and nobody had work, nobody, except theater, you know, and, and for kids. Uh, and so Friday, I got another uh, reading, and a man said, what's your name? And I got that out okay, and he said, what have you done? And I said, well, last year I was in play this way and this way. I just memorized the titles, you know. And he said, here, read this. So I read seven or eight pages, I guess, of what, what I thought was a play. I don't know, you know, I know nothing. And he said, fine, we'll let you know, and you know you never hear from him again, right? I got home, and I'm in a Broadway play. And, <laughs> and it starts rehearsal the following Monday. This is Friday, it starts the following Monday. I don't even know where the theater is. I don't know what a rehearsal is. I know nothing. <laughs> anyway, absolutely. And uh, so uh, I started to find out where the theater is, and my mother can't go with me, you know. She's got four other kids at home, and one of them's one year old. And, and uh, so I went alone. And I started rehearsing. Van Heflin was the leading man. Ever you remember Van Heflin? Of course we remember. Uh, well, he was he was a wonderful Broadway actor too. And uh, we opened Cold in New York without taking it on the road first. We opened in New York Cold in a play called God, I even remember. I can't remember the name. Uh, Western Waters. And there are twelve people in the cast, and I'm one of the twelve. And I don't know what I'm doing. Uh, so I learned how to be an actor by being paid to learn. And it was wonderful because every play I was in, I was in five Broadway plays in New York before I made a motion picture. And uh, every play I was always in, there was always a character man or a character woman off stage, and I'd come off and say, what were you doing out there tonight? What is this with your hands and the thing? You know, New Yorkers talk with their hands, but actors don't, do you know why? And I'd say, no, no ma'am, you know I'm about this big. And she said, well, well, because if you're waving your hands around when you talk, people are looking at you instead of where they should look. Don't you do that anymore. So they taught me stage technique while I'm being paid. 
and it was a miracle. The same way with motion pictures. Uh, now, when you, you got to Hollywood, what, 39, 40? 1939, September 12th. Yeah. Uh, uh, really, your first big picture was Tom Brown's School Days, is that yeah, correct? I made two, two before that. Right, yeah, right, yeah. right. But that was, that was at RKO, and you were Tom Brown. How did yeah. that, did that well, just elevate you immediately? Another to a piece point? of the, the wonderful blind dumb luck I always had. Uh, None of my other brothers and sisters came anywhere near the theater, and, and no, nobody would hire them anyway because they were all amateurs, you know, and so was I. And uh, uh, at, at RKO, I'm the only, uh, the way I got to RKO is I made this paramount picture for this wonderful director who came in from, from Hollywood, and he was sick and tired of Hollywood. He was going to make his film in New York, and he needed a boy. I played the lead in the picture, by the way. Uh, because the, the, I had a, about one third of the picture, and then my character grew up to be Wallace Ford and Stu Irwin and those people in, in a regular Paramount film. Once again, luck. I got star Billy in the first picture I ever made, and I didn't know anything about motion pictures either. <laughs> nothing. <laughs> now, uh, uh, when the picture was over, I went under contract to this man, William K. Howard, who was one of the great, great motion picture. Uh, producer, director, writers in the history of our business from the silent days on. And he was such a kind man, and he taught me everything uh, that, that I've ever known about motion pictures. He taught me, and he was such a kind gentleman. And anyway, uh, I went under contract to him after the picture was finished, and the contracts nowadays are the same as they were then, 40 out of 52 weeks, so if you have a few weeks off in between working, they, they, they don't have to pay you, you know? So uh, the, once the, the 12 weeks of free is up, they have to pay you for the rest of the year, 40 weeks. And uh, 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 when my 12 weeks were up, I went back to do another play and that sort of thing and some radio and to make a living because I'm the only one in the family working. I'm scared of green. I don't know what I'm doing. And uh, uh, when, the, when the 12 weeks of free were up, he was almost about to pay me. And he didn't have the money, so he sold my contract to RKO. And I came to a major studio in Hollywood for the first time. I'm the only child in, in, the, in the RKO. And I have to run of the studio. I have to go to school now, uh, you know, uh, from 9 o'clock in the morning till noon when I'm not working. And then I have lunch in the commissary. And then I have the rest of the afternoon to go into the cutting rooms and, and meet the cutters, you call them uh, 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 editors, film editors, we call them cutters, you know. And they're teaching me all about what they do because there were no secrets then, you know. Every studio was a, was a solid piece by itself and uh, those, those people had had jobs for, for all year long. They didn't have to go and look for a job like actors do when they're not under contract, you know. They're getting paid every week. And the same with the music stages, and I'm looking at some of the finest composers in the world, and, and con composers, and, and, and I'm learning about scoring film, about dubbing film, which is the last thing we do, and, and, and seeing what, what, what I saw tonight, and, you know, where nitrate film will not last in the, in the dark. Uh, yeah. So you went to the University of RKO. I did. Yeah. I learned how to make motion pictures from the producer's point yeah. of view, yeah. but not the actor.